Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's public lecture sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. I'm Marie Griffith, director of the center, and I do want to mention that we have two more public events yet to come this semester. Uh, there's information about these events in the entryway just outside this room. I'd like to invite you all to take information about the center, to join our email list, and contact us with any feedback, suggestions for future events, and the like. As I hope you know by now, the center serves as an ideologically diverse venue for fostering rigorous scholarship and informing broad academic and public communities about the intersections of religion and U.S. politics. In other words, we are exhaustive uh, or small c Catholic in our own politics and ideologies. With these goals in mind, we encourage the conversation and debate that make possible this rigorous engagement across the political and religious spectrum, and we invite and need your assistance as we take up these vital challenges. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Christopher Eisgruber, a scholar who is greatly admired in a whole host of fields for his work in constitutional law, including a host of issues relating to religion and religious freedom, and someone who is equally venerated for his extraordinary leadership in university administration. Professor Eisgruber received his AB in physics from Princeton University and then spent a year at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. In 1988, he received the JD from the University of Chicago Law School, where he served as editor-in-chief of the University of Chicago Law Review. Professor Eisgruber has served since 2001 as the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Public Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School and the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University, as associate faculty in the Department of Politics, and since 2004 as the provost of Princeton University uh, as well. I will say he was my provost uh, and Lee Schmidt served under him as well and he is an extraordinary leader uh, and has great capacity in uh, those ways. He formerly served as director of the program in law and public affairs at Princeton and prior to coming to Princeton, Professor Eisgruber was professor of law at New York University School of Law, where he taught for 11 years uh, on the law school faculty there, after clerking for Justice John Paul Stevens uh, in the US Supreme Court. Eisgruber has authored or co-authored over 60 articles in books and academic journals, and he has also been an important legal voice in the public sphere submitting legislative testimony for numerous House and Senate committee hearings and authoring an impressive array, I will add, of editorial writings that have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and Forbes, among many others. He has also published four books that have been widely read and admired, Constitutional Self-Government, published in 2001, Global Justice and the Bulwarks of Localism, Human Rights in Context, published in 2005. The Next Justice, Repairing the Supreme Court Appointments Process, published in 2007. And most relevant for us here, Religious Freedom and the Constitution, also published in 2007. Professor Eisgruber will speak to us today from a new project he is co-authoring with Lawrence Sager that asks whether and how arguments about American religious freedom might apply to other liberal constitutional democracies. His talk is titled Religious Equality, American Commitment or Global Ideal. Please join me in welcoming now Professor Christopher Eisgruber. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to come out here to St. Louis to speak with all of you uh, today. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to uh, see Marie and uh, Lee Schmidt uh, 
two colleagues I very much regret having lost from uh, Princeton University uh, where he praised my uh, capacities as a university administrator. That was uh, one where I wish I had been done a bit better at uh, retaining them, but you're very fortunate to have them here, obviously, at um, Washington University of St. Louis. Um, I also want to thank uh, Marie and Deborah Kennard and the uh, Center for uh, the great hospitality I've been shown over the course of my uh, visit here. I'll tell you, as I was preparing to give these uh, remarks, I spent a little bit of time online watching uh, some of the earlier uh, lectures, and each of the lecturers began, as I just did, by uh, thanking the Center for its tremendous hospitality. And my, my reaction was to uh, think, wow, you have invited a set of very polite uh, people uh, to come. <laughs> And you may well have uh, done that, but I will also say that the hospitality here is extraordinary, and I'm very grateful for it. And finally, I do want to thank uh, Senator uh, John uh, Danforth and the Danforth family for their support of scholarship in the area of uh, religion and politics as manifested in this uh, center, center here. Uh, the Danforth family obviously has been a great friend and supporter of this university and of my own university, Princeton. And we are very grateful uh, for that support. Finally, in part of this long prolegomena here, I want to say how happy I am to uh, have had a chance to come here to uh, St. Louis for many reasons, uh, one of which is that it's been uh, important to my own family's flight from uh, racial and religious uh, persecution. Uh, as I had told Marie when I accepted her uh, invitation, uh, my mother and her parents, along with uh, most of my uh, grandmother's family were Holocaust uh, refugees who escaped to the United States and uh, eventually here to uh, St. Louis where she graduated from Hancock High and then eventually came back to work for the McDonnell uh, Aircraft uh, Company. Now, I, I, I tell you this uh, not just, uh, well, not at all because I think you're particularly interested in my family's history. Uh, nor as, as, as part of a um, sort of transparent attempt to gather local sympathy before starting my argument, although there's a bit of that uh, there, but it, because it also has some relevance to my themes uh, this afternoon. As I said, my, my mother and uh, my grandmother's family came here to the United States. Uh, my grandfather's uh, two brothers uh, took refuge in uh, Israel. Uh, it's because of the availability of those two refuges that the family was able to escape from the terror of the Holocaust and the comparison between those two uh, regimes of uh, refuge in the United States and in Israel will be a major part of my argument uh, this afternoon. So I want to start with, with two observations and uh, a question. And uh, Marie has already presaged the, the basic theme of the, the argument. The, the, the first observation is that we here in the United States have a uh, remarkable and deep commitment to religious uh, equality. That uh, commitment, and I'll say a little bit more uh, about it in a moment, particularly because this commitment is sometimes overshadowed by attention to disagreements that we have in the United States, but that commitment is shared among people who uh, disagree in other respects about what religious freedom means here and elsewhere. The commitment includes the idea not only that the government ought to treat uh, different religious uh, denominations equally, but also the idea, which you might think of as uh, separate, but which I think is equality related, uh, that individuals are free to express themselves religiously in public and to respect, uh, express themselves on the basis of their personal uh, convictions. Um, the basic theme, both of this respect for denominational equality and of this respect for individual expression is a kind of uh, more general respect for individual uh, choices about uh, religion, including the choice to be, for example, very and uh, visibly uh, religious, to manifest your religiosity by, for example, wearing a headscarf, something that in other countries uh, might be regarded as inconsistent with the commitment to uh, religious uh, equality. Second observation. Uh, is that this commitment, although extraordinarily broadly shared within the American constitutional uh, tradition, is widely rejected elsewhere, including in uh, places that maintain a very healthy respect for religious freedom and uh, religious toleration. So certainly Great Britain, for example, on any historical or contemporary scale 
of uh, religious freedom should rank very highly, but the preference for the Church of England is something that would be utterly inconsistent with the American constitutional tradition and recognized as such by people who otherwise disagree sharply with one another. So those are the two observations. And then the, the question which uh, Marie mentioned in her uh, introduction is, what should we make of that uh, disparity? How should we think about the fact that something that is so critical and fundamental to our way of thinking about religious freedom seems so rarely applied in other uh, regimes, including ones we respect very much? So let me start by backing up a little bit and saying something more about uh, this very broad uh, agreement uh, that I think we have in the United States. Popular accounts and perceptions of uh, religious freedom, as I said a moment ago, often emphasize disagreement. So you know, there are various topics that are sort of regulars of the op-ed pages or the, the front page of any uh, newspaper on, on which we genuinely, as Americans, do uh, disagree, for example. May the government provide parents with tuition uh, vouchers that uh, they can use to send their children to private schools, including religious schools. That's a very controversial topic. May the government uh, display religious symbols by, for example, sponsoring uh, a creche display at uh, Christmas time. That, that particular topic, however important or unimportant you may think it uh, is, can generate arguments as heated as about any in American uh, religious freedom. May religious institutions claim exemptions from otherwise applicable laws. So for example, must a Catholic ha hospital comply with provisions of the Affordable Care Act requiring employers to uh, include contraception within their employees' health insurance packages? That question about exemptions from generally applicable laws is one in about which there is vibrant disagreement. And I don't mean to deny any of those uh, disagreements. They are real and they are very important and there are reasons why we all take them seriously and contest them. But if we focus on the disagreements alone, we miss something very important and uh, distinctive, a profound sense of agreement about uh, propositions that are remarkably controversial on a global scale or on a um, historical uh, scale. So two strong notions in particular are ones that I want to call your attention to. The first is a proposition of uh, denominational equality, and the Supreme Court said in a relatively obscure case about uh, tax laws and uh, charities uh, called Larson versus Valente, um, the, the following, uh, the, the clearest command of the Establishment Clause is that one religious denomination cannot be preferred over uh, another. For example, I mentioned a moment ago the, uh, the debate that exists within our society about uh, tuition vouchers and whether or not government money can ever be used to pay for religious schools. That's controversial. But what's not controversial is that if the government creates a voucher program, that voucher program must be non-preferential. It must be non-preferential in the sense that if it provides tuition vouchers for schools, it cannot prefer some religions over others, nor can it prefer religion over non-religion. The agreement about that proposition, it seems to me, is even more fundamental than the disagreement about the question of whether or not money can reach these schools. Second point of uh, agreement with regard to individual expression, all faiths are equally free to express themselves publicly. So there's disagreement about under what circumstances, uh, say, a high school principal at a high school graduation ceremony might or might not say a prayer. But there's not disagreement. There's strong agreement about individual religious speech and the fact that individual religious speech, even in public settings, does not create a problem from the standpoint of the disestablishment norm. Government speech is more problematic precisely from the standpoint of equality, that is, it appears to take sides between or among religious positions, but individual speech is given a great deal of deference. There are two nine-nothing decisions, and I emphasize nine-nothing because in these uh, cases about uh, constitutional uh, principles, there's always a tendency, and I do it all the time in my own writing, there's always a tendency to focus on the five to four cases. Those are the ones that occupy the headlines. But there are two nine-nothing cases from 1993 that seem to me to illustrate these two principles. 
One of them is called Lamb's Chapel versus Center Mauritius School District. This was about a Long Island school district. It had a rule that said that uh, um, civic groups could come in and use school property for their meetings, say for a lecture like this one, uh, after the school hours were uh, concluded. And it was a pretty um, open set of circumstances, except they said religious groups cannot come in and use the school premises for religious meetings, and they said they can't do that because that would be a violation of the Establishment Clause. Supreme Court ruled 9 nothing that that rule, which discriminated against religious speech in public settings, was unconstitutional. 9 nothing. no disagreement between the liberals and the conservatives. If you're going to open up your school buildings to all civic groups, you cannot exclude religious groups. Remarkable that that is a 9 nothing proposition. And the second of these two cases, in my view, is even more remarkable. In fact, it's close to my favorite case in American constitutional law, partly because of the name, which is one of the few that seems to deserve to be put to music or something. This is the, the Church of the Lakumi Babalu I versus City of Hialeah. Lakumi Babalu I versus City of Hialeah. Nine nothing decision in which the city of Hialeah concerned about Santerians who were performing chicken sacrifices within the city of Hialeah passed a law prohibiting ritual slaughter in Hialeah. Supreme Court said by a 9 nothing vote that's unconstitutional. You can't do that because it prohibits ritual slaughter. It focuses on religious activity in particular and discriminates against it. The idea that we've come to a point in our history where the Supreme Court would 9 nothing protect Santerians who are engaged in chicken sacrifice, almost unimaginable if you look back uh, 30 years, but representative of a very strong commitment to uh, religious uh, equality. Now, this wasn't always so. I, I said 30 years ago, if you look back to that, you're going to get something very different. If you look back to the founding, and this is important for the argument I'm going to make about whether or not these norms travel, if you look back to the founding, you find a different view from at least some commentators. I don't know that Thomas Jefferson would be at all opposed. Might be happy with that uh, decision, actually. But Joseph Story, in his commentaries on the Constitution, has this to say about uh, the, the uh, religion clauses. He says, the real object of the First Amendment was not to countenance, much less to advance Mohammedanism or Judaism or infidelity by prostrating Christianity, but rather to exclude all rivalry among Christian sects and to prevent any national ecclesiastical establishment which should give to an hierarchy the exclusive patronage of the national government. And he goes on to say then, thus the whole power over the subject of religion is left exclusively to the state governments to be acted upon according to their own sense of justice and the state constitutions. But then he adds, and, and the Catholic and the Protestant, the Calvinist and the Armenian, the Jew and the infidel may sit down at the common table of the national councils without any inquisition into their faith or mode of worship. So still an equality theme, but only at the national level and a strong affirmation, and I'll give you another quote a bit later from him, that really this is all about Christianity and don't you think for a moment that it doesn't presuppose a preference for uh, Christianity. Go on beyond Joseph's story, and there is a long history of uh, persecution in this country of minority uh, faiths, including the, the Catholic and Jewish faiths that are now very accepted into the mainstream. And there are still some limits in the Supreme Court despite these nine nothing decisions. So Justice Scalia in the McCreary case, which is a case about um, a Ten Commandments display inside of a courthouse, uh, said in his opinion, the Establishment Clause permits the disregard of polytheists and believers in unconcerned deities, that is deists, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. That is a minority view on the current Supreme Court, but is a view on the current Supreme Court, and it's a limitation on this equality principle. But I would note that even Justice Scalia, and even with his profound regard for originalism and founders' uh, intention, wouldn't go anywhere near what Joseph Story said in the quotations that I read uh, earlier, he would immediately affirm that for those who do believe in a single deity, including Muslims and Jews, they are as entitled to the protection of the amendment as is Christianity. So the agreement here, I would submit to you, is a real and meaningful agreement and a pretty extraordinary one. For all of our talk about 
um, separation and whether the wall of separation should be higher and uh, lower, we have a broad agreement in this country about um, equality. We disagree about how far the principle goes. Uh, my co-author, Larry Sager, and I think it goes quite far uh, indeed, and we put it at the heart of our theory of uh, religious freedom. Others think re equality is less of the story, but in any event, it's a very robust norm. Among people who are uh, religious freedom litigators, I think it's a strikingly robust uh, norm at this point. So if you have a, a group of religious freedom litigators together, some of them are more secular, some are more religious, it's very hard to get an argument going about a topic like school prayer. Almost all of them at this point agree with the constitutional decisions prohibiting the government from prescribing prayers. And the reason for that is almost all of them are interested in the fate of religious uh, minorities. They recognize that every faith in this country is uh, a minority, and they don't want the government prescribing what it is that people ought to believe. That topic remains more controversial in the larger political culture, but there are still very stripy, striking uh, popular culture examples. Here are a couple, as I think you all know. The current composition of our Supreme Court, again, almost unimaginable, what, 30 years ago? There was six Catholics and three Jews and no Protestants on the current Supreme Court. For a long time, there was one Catholic seat and one Jewish seat recognized as such, and the idea that within a few decades we would be where we are now, and that very few people would be very upset. Occasionally you can find some people who are, but not very many. Right after 9-11, uh, uh, George W. Uh, Bush was uh, talking publicly on uh, the radio about the importance of uh, protecting women of cover, that was his phrase, as they uh, went uh, shopping. This was in response to incidents that targeted uh, Muslim uh, women. But for that kind of response to be the quick response, even at a time of national tragedy where there were laws that I as a civil libertarian regarded as overreaching, for the president to come out and protect an unpopular religious minority using that term is extraordinary. So, um, so that's the American uh, agreement that I want to describe to you. And now I'll mention just in a little bit more detail what I've already said about the rest of the world. The rest of the world, denominational preferences, which are anathema to the American constitutional uh, tradition at this point, the idea that you might prefer, say, Judaism over Christianity or vice versa, those kinds of preferences, which are anathema here, are common in one way or another. So I've already mentioned the existence of established uh, churches, important in a very tolerant constitutional regime, such as the uh, Church of England. There are European practices, for example, of crucifixes in uh, courtrooms. I'm going to talk some more about a religiously defined uh, homeland, uh, Israel, in a moment. I want to take, take another moment to at least mention the uh, examples of France and uh, Turkey, which are both uh, secular regimes, but regimes which, in a way that I've already alluded to, also depart from this broad uh, American uh, consensus. And they depart not by denominational preference, but by suppression on public expressions of individual religious identity. So in both France and Turkey, the view that we have here, which is that your speech is your speech and your expression is your expression, and if that means you want to wear a very large cross or a yarmulke, or if you want to veil in the Muslim uh, tradition, you can do that in uh, public, and it's a part of your honoring your own tradition and also expressing what it is that you uh, believe. In neither France nor Turkey is that norm, uh, which is again a fundamental matter of agreement across the political spectrum in the United States, uh, respected rather in the name of uh, equality, those kinds of uh, expressions, particularly with regard to the veil are, uh, and the headscarf are uh, prohibited. So the question now I want to ask about this difference is this. That is, how should we regard this American commitment to religious uh, equality? Is it something where noticing these difference and, and feeling this rather fundamental commitment to this American view, we say that, well, that's, that's just what we do here in America. This is our way of doing things, and those are those other ways of doing things. Or should we apply that uh, norm and say uh, these other regimes, because they're doing something different from us, are unjust, or is there something else to be? Um, said. 
In theory, one might take the first kind of view about this. One, that is, one might say, all right, uh, these are our norms, and indeed, uh, they are matters of broad agreement uh, here, but that's just kind of a contingent historical and cultural fact about who we are as uh, Americans. We might say, well, earlier in our history, this thing was written down in our Constitution, and therefore, it defines us as a matter of positive law, but that's just us. Madison and Jefferson gave it to us, and now we're committed to it, and we don't need to worry about any inconsistencies uh, with that. I, I have three problems uh, with uh, this kind of view. The first is simply that our history doesn't support it, and I, I gave you uh, some of the evidence for that. It, it wasn't just written down uh, this way, and Joseph Story, was the great commentator on the Constitution when he wrote this uh, uh, treatise of his on the Constitution, had a very different view about what it uh, meant, and our practice although I think very consistent, not perfectly consistent, but very consistent with this ideal now, has not been consistent with it throughout all of our history. Instead, we've worked our way toward this ideal. The second is that, in my view at least, there's simply no way to interpret what actually is in the Constitution without some reference to ideals of political uh, justice. So Congress shall make uh, no law prohibiting the free exercise of uh, religion. All right, that's a, a clearly stated norm, but now what exactly is the free exercise of uh, religion? That states a value, and you need to know something about that value. You need to make an argument about it in order to get closer to the sorts of propositions that I gave a moment ago, such as this may entitle you to constitutional immunity from a law that prohibits you from slaughtering chickens if it's written in a certain way. That's not a straight read off of the text of the Constitution. That's the application of some uh, values to this. And finally, and I think most importantly, but I submit this to each of you to think about whether or not you agree with it because it's a claim about you in part, I, I would submit that most Americans who accept the principle of equality that I've described accept it not in a sort of aw shucks way, it just happens to be there in our Constitution, but rather because we believe it's right. Yes, it's in our Constitution and we're proud that it's in our Constitution. This is what we stand for. It isn't something like the uh, provision that says, for example, no person who is not a natural born citizen can become President of the United States. Many people think that proposition is simply a proposition that uh, is written into the Constitution, so therefore it is binding uh, law, but it's not necessarily one we would uh, put there. And indeed, that law is applied to the governor of any state would be regarded as inconsistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. All citizens are equally eligible to become uh, governors. But that's not the way we think about um, religious uh, freedom. So the second option, which I've mentioned, is, all right, if, we, if, if it's not just what happens to be our history, but it's uh, really a principle of uh, religious freedom, from our standpoint, a principle of uh, justice, we could say, uh, well, it means we have to reject all uh, inconsistent requirements. And maybe England is pretty good in terms of religious freedom, but they do have that established church, therefore they are uh, unjust. Uh, and uh, Israel may have many things, it's a controversial case, I realize, many things that, that make it admirable and there is strong support for it, but you know, I, don't, I don't know how you could have strong support for Israel and, and believe this proposition. You would have to believe that Israel would have to abandon its uh, status as a, uh, a Jewish uh, state. And every other regime that, that doesn't embrace this, France, it's also inconsistent with justice because it doesn't do things the way that we want to do it. The project that my uh, co-author and I are embarked on right now is to ask whether or not there's a, a, a defensible and principled middle ground between these two options on the extreme. Now they're saying that either America is historically contingent or America is the only way. The question is, is there a way to say that we have a full-bodied commitment to equality and that commitment to equality ought to apply across regimes? but that the American version of this commitment is only one version of it and we might recognize others, others that could be consistent even with the idea of a Jewish state. And in the work that we are in the midst of publishing uh, right now, I've tried to give an affirmative answer to uh, that um, question. And let me first uh, describe to you the uh, general uh, strategy that we are using, and then say a little bit uh, more about the Israeli case before uh, subsiding for uh, questions. 
um, we make a distinction, uh, which I, I for, for better or for ill, I know that some of you in the audience are uh, lawyers, but for better or the ill, I know it will sound very lawyerly as I first uh, make the distinction, but we think it demarcates between two very important ideas. And the distinction is between equal membership and equal regard. Equal membership is an idea that applies to persons. Equal regard is an idea that applies to practices. Equal membership uh, is the idea that no person should be regarded less well because of his or her religious affiliation or lack thereof. You want to be equally a member of the polity, this polity, but any polity, regardless of whether you are Jewish or Christian or Muslim or a non-believer. Uh, That's the idea of equal membership. The idea of equal regard is the, the idea that the government must accommodate minority religious practices to the same extent that it does mainstream or majority ones. Equal regard is a more specific idea than equal membership. My, my co-author and I have argued that equal regard is the best way of understanding the American version of uh, equal membership. It's one way of implementing uh, equal membership. It's a way that is manifestly inconsistent with any kind of denominational preference. So once you've signed on for equal regard, the idea that you not only have to treat persons as equal members, but that you also have to treat practices equally, the Church of England or the idea of the Jewish state are immediately eliminated. And if that's what our commitment to equality means, if that's the baseline principle of justice, then there's no way to say you accept the principle and, but might have a different view of other regimes. But the idea of equal membership is a bit more flexible. It at least allows the question, could you take different attitudes under some circumstances toward different practices and nevertheless respect equality of membership? And so I wanna, I wanna try to suggest to you how this might possibly be true with regard to Israel, that is a defense of a Jewish state as consistent with the idea of equal membership, recognizing that current Jewish state uh, includes, for example, a 20% Arab minority. And I'm, those of you who know the arguments about Israel, I'm not talking now about the West Bank or the, the Gaza Strip. There's a 20% Arab minority within the state of Israel. And the only way you get a consistency with equal membership is if you can be a Jewish state and have a sizable minority of non-Jews and still recognize equal membership. And that rather difficult needle to thread is the, the argument that we want to suggest is uh, sustainable in principle. Now, I, I mean to ask this in a way that is, is fundamentally sympathetic uh, to uh, Israel and its aspirations, but I want to be clear here that I'm, I'm not meaning to ask whether the current state of Israel with all of its current practices, respects equal membership uh, adequately. In my view, it clearly uh, does not with regard either to the treatment of Palestinians on the West Bank or to the Arab-Israeli population that I mentioned, or for that matter, to the treatment of uh, various reformed Jews within the uh, state of Israel who are unable to uh, marry within uh, Israel under uh, Israeli uh, law. These are all real problems, but the question we want to ask is, can you have, in principle, without violating this fundamental idea of equal membership, a Jewish state, and one that I would say is consistent with what Israel itself said in the declaration of the uh, establishment of the Israeli state. For those of you who have read um, the declaration, you will know that it not only sets out the aspiration to be a Jewish state, it also includes the following language, which is a more robust guarantee of equality than any that I know of, certainly in American constitutional law. It's more robust than the American Constitution or our declaration. Israel says in its declaration of the establishment of the state uh, that the state will, quoting, ensure complete equality of social and uh, political rights to all of its inhabitants, irrespective of race, religion, or sex. Complete equality of social or political rights, irrespective of race, religion, and sex. That's the way Israel gets started with that aspiration right alongside the aspiration to be Jewish state. So one way of formulating the question I'm asking right now is, was that just a contradiction in the declaration, or can we take Israel at its word when it says that? A, a lot of the writing right now about uh, Israel formulates problems that are sort of adjacent to those that I'm uh, talking about in terms of whether or not Israel can simultaneously be Jewish and democratic. 
That's a hard problem given a 20% uh, minority. But Jewish and egalitarian, and egalitarian by Israel's own terms is an even harder uh, question. So we think that there's the possibility of an affirmative answer uh, here for Israel or any other what we would call homeland state, provided that it meets three rather demanding uh, requirements. First, that there be equality regarding reasons for departures from the norm that I mentioned earlier of equal regard. Second, that norms of non-discrimination are respected to the extent possible. And third, that the state reflect, re respects an affirmative obligation of what we call solicitous inclusion. So let me go through each of these in order. First, the idea of equality regarding reasons for the creation and existence of uh, an ethnic homeland or a religious homeland, or in this case of Israel, a, uh, a Jewish homeland. If one reflects on the circumstances uh, that gave rise to the state of Israel, one can immediately understand why it is that within a, a global context, the creation of a Jewish state can actually be equality uh, regarding rather than antagonistic uh, to equality. And here, I'll, again, my, this is the connection to the family story that I uh, told at the uh, beginning. Uh, Israel came into being in order to provide uh, refuge to minorities who were being uh, persecuted, a particular minority that was being persecuted and had no other source of refuge in the world against the threat at the time of genocide, and came into being in order to provide that minority community with a kind of recognition that it enjoyed nowhere else in the world. That is, it was a people that existed everywhere only as a minority. And the existence of a place where that minority could enjoy these benefits of community and recognition, as other peoples do, was offered as an equality-based argument at the time and resonates in equality. These are genuinely equality-based rationales in light of world circumstances. They're equality-based rationales in light of world circumstances that require genuine and deep commitment rather than a mere claim to primacy. It's not a claim, well, all right, so we're a Jewish state, we can do what we want in the name of that. It's a claim that we're a Jewish state and therefore we must accept and we want to accept all persons who are being persecuted on this particular ground. And so it has a demanding kind, for example, of immigration rule, which is on the one hand both preferential, that is the law of return that says that anybody who is uh, Jewish or the child or grandchild of Jews can immigrate and become a citizen of Israel, a demanding immigration rule that we would never accept here, right? This is not our rule in the United States, and those who declare us to be a Christian nation do not believe that we have any obligation, for example, to admit all Christians across our borders. Contrast this kind of rationale to Joseph Story's explanation. I'll come back to Joseph Story, whom I genuinely admire and started my academic career by writing something nice about, but, but today, Joseph, come back to Joseph Story's explanation for the priority of Christianity. He says, and at all events, it is impossible for those who believe in the truth of Christianity as a divine revelation to doubt that it is the especial duty of government to foster and encourage it among all the citizens and subjects. That's in the same set of paragraphs where he's explaining his view of the purposes of the First uh, Amendment. He goes on to argue that Christianity in particular and Protestantism in general is the best foundation for Republican government. It's an argument people have offered over the centuries, but it's not an equality-based argument. Whatever else you may think about it, it's not an equality-based argument. Is it, on the contrary, an argument for priority? So the first restriction that we think is necessary in order to render a homeland state, as we call it, a kind of ethnically national state consistent with equal membership, is that the rationale for it must be equality regarding rather than sounding in uh, priority. And then the next two. To the extent possible, the state must respect norms of non-discrimination. Insofar as it provides any benefits preferentially, it must provide them only insofar as is necessary to support the equality regarding, regarding rationales that justify its existence. So a preferential immigration rule is most likely uh, to fit that category. 
There may be other rules that are compatible with, for example, Israel's status as a homeland state, including its rules that delegate more authority over marriage and family law to religious authorities than we would allow here. We think that that kind of de delegation can be consistent with equal membership, but only if it looks a little different from what currently exists in Israel. One thing that Israel does that is consistent with this norm of non-discrimination is the authority that it provides to the Jewish community, and actually, in fact, only to, to the Orthodox uh, rabbinate within the Jewish community. It also supply, applies or makes available to other religious communities within Israel. We think at least one further thing is necessary. That is that there has to be a secular baseline so that anybody who doesn't want to participate in any of the religious communities is not compelled uh, to do so. We would also say that the monopoly granted to the uh, Orthodox rabbinate would be inconsistent with this norm of uh, non-discrimination. But different polities may adopt different norms here, provided that whenever they can share these benefits, they do share these benefits. And the final requirement that we apply is a requirement that we call uh, solicitous inclusion, a kind of bending over backward to avoid the harms that foreseeably follow when you have an ethnic uh, preference. So anytime you set up a state and say this is a state for a particular people who are a subpart of the population, Israel is the Jewish state, it is therefore the homeland of the Jewish people who are less than 80% of the population, by that declaration you have a reason for affirmative concern that anybody who doesn't fit that specification may be relegated to second class citizenship. Our view is that a state that goes down this demanding path toward equal membership has to be cognizant of that and bend over backward to make sure that both material and symbolic benefits are accorded to minority populations uh, within the state. Unfortunately, this is not something uh, that Israel has done, for example, with regard to its um, Arab-Israeli uh, minorities who often are nominally equal under uh, law, for example, in their access to the vote, and nominally with regard to, say, educational uh, benefits, uh, but far from uh, being uh, the beneficiaries of solicitous inclusion and affirmative attention are generally neglected uh, comparatively in the provision of social services. But if these requirements are met, we think this is a way that a state could say we have equality regarding reasons for having a kind of preference different from what you see in liberal pluralism, but we accept other obligations to care about equality so that we can genuinely make a claim to respect equal membership. And we go on, that is Larry and I in this uh, uh, body of work, to suggest that there are three different kinds of regimes, which I'll just mention right now, though I'm happy to speak more to them later, three different kinds of regimes, all of which pursue equal membership in different ways. That is liberal pluralism, take the United States as uh, an example of that, but uh, the current German constitutional system, I think, would also function that way, as does the Canadian one and most of the former Anglo-American, uh, Anglo uh, colonies. Uh, so liberal pluralism as one, civic nationalism, of which France is an example, that is a kind of robust commitment to the uh, creation of a um, secular civic uh, identity. Um, and again, just as the United States doesn't achieve all of its ideals and Israel doesn't achieve all of its ideals, neither does France. We don't think that this uh, uh, justifies the uh, civic, the, the ban on the headscarf or the veil that uh, they have put in place, but it helps to explain why they might reach some different conclusions. And then ethnic nationalism, of which Israel is an example. I'm happy to talk further of those, but I'd like to conclude just by, by giving you the short summary of the uh, answer that, that uh, I and, and my co-author want to advance to the question with which I began about whether our commitment to these equality principles in the United States requires us, if we regard them as indeed principles, to apply them um, overseas. We do think that America's tradition of religious freedom insists as a matter of justice, not just historical fact, on a fundamental and demanding equality norm. We think that achievement of that principle is important and worthy of our pride. In other words, it's not just a feature of our history, but reflects the application of an ideal worth holding to American circumstances. 
We should recognize that we may and indeed should apply equality norms beyond our borders when thinking about personal and national obligations, so there's no reason for us to be uh, relativists who uh, say, well, look, it's, you know, equality is just an American thing. Others can do what they will. But we believe that the application of these equality norms will have to be sensitive to the distinction between equal membership and equal regard and to the legitimate variation in justice-seeking projects pursued by multiple nations. I thank you for your attention, and I would be delighted to respond to questions. Thanks.